and welcome to today's webcast. I'm Dr. Sheila Sigerson, and I'll be your host today. Thank you for joining us for the first in our two-part series about one of the most vulnerable populations in animal shelters, healthy, medium, and large dogs who are declining. Today, we'll show you how to change the way you approach making life and death decisions for more challenging dogs by looking at four key elements to a successful outcome. Joining me is Kristen Hassan, the Director of Animal Services at Pima Animal Care Center in Tucson, Arizona. Every year, PAC takes in 17,000 homeless, lost, and abandoned pets, and they serve 15,000 additional animals through animal protection and outreach services. Under Kristen's direction, PAC is saving more than 90%, congratulations, Kristen and team, of the cats and dogs who come to the shelter. She's an expert at finding new ways of thinking about and acting on practical life-saving initiatives. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Sheila. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kristen Hassan Auerbach and I'm here today to talk with you about how to save more big dogs. Um, and this presentation, every presentation that I do, I usually dedicate to a pet, um, but this presentation is dedicated to the Puma Animal Care Center volunteers and fosters because without them, there's no way I could be talking to you about this today. They are absolutely at the heart of all of our life-saving efforts. So thank you, PAC volunteers and fosters. You make it all possible. So I am an animal services director. I've been leading municipal animal services agencies, including animal control for the past seven and a half years. And in that time, I have had no greater struggle than trying to save the lives of medium and large dogs. Uh, and so starting in 2013, um, working in collaboration with a number of colleagues, we started to just try a lot of new things to save the lives of big dogs. And since that time, I have taken three municipal shelters, two or above a 90% save rate for medium and large dogs. And those shelters range in intake from 5,000 to 19,000. I am not a animal trainer, I'm not a dog trainer, and I'm not a behaviorist, but I am a person that loves dogs and somebody struggling with medium and large dogs like so many of you um, and trying to do new things to save their lives. Really quick um, facts about Pima Animal Care Center. Uh, so you know why I'm here talking to you about this today. We have about an 18,000 intake overall and about a 92% true live release rate. That's noses in, noses out with an 11 day average length of stay. So most of our pets move through the system quite quickly. We carry about three to 400 dogs in a shelter at any time. Most of those are big dogs. We do about a thousand adoptions a month. Last year, we sent 2,500 dogs to foster and about 5,000 animals total. And right now at PAC, we're only housing three dogs with the length of stay greater than 90 days. So um, our emphasis is on getting those long stay dogs out quickly so that we don't have dogs in the system for a long time. One of the first questions that comes up when we start talking about big dogs is public safety. And at our, our organization, um, we take that pretty seriously. So we are always tracking all data around uh, bites while we track a decrease in euthanasia because we believe that public safety and life-saving are consistent with each other. Um, this is an example of one of our um, data sets. So this is our overall animal bites in the community. So we are actually on a downward trend for bites and we are also on a downward trend for dog euthanasia. So we've gone from euthanizing thousands of dogs a year to um, this year we're on track to euthanize um, 800 or so. We also track bites in the shelter, bites of adopted dogs, and bites per capita because all of that data really matters when we're trying to prove that life saving is consistent with public safety. So the problem we're facing today in sheltering is really different than problems we faced even when I started in the field. Um, back in the old days, there were a lot of dogs and they didn't have anyone connected to them. Most, most people didn't even know they existed and they were dying en masse in our organizations. At PAC in 2014, long before I was here, the euthanasia rate was over 50% and they were euthanizing more than 10,000 animals a year. 
Today, the problem is really different, particularly in high performing shelters. This is the this is one of the walls at our shelter where these are all dogs that have been euthanized or have died at our facility. Most of these dogs have been euthanized for uh, behavioral reasons. They're dogs that we didn't feel we had a safe outcome option. And what you'll notice is that there's little hearts on all of their picture because there were volunteers and fosters connected to these pets. They wanted to help them and they couldn't. Um, and so, so the problem isn't this anonymous group of dogs now, it's that we have these animals that there are people that love and care about them, but we can't find appropriate outcome paths for them. And this is the problem we're working to solve at PAC. I wanted to start today with a few starting points. Um, and really the purpose of today's webcast, this is a two part webcast. And the purpose of today is to dispel a couple of myths that we hear all the time. One is that shelters somehow have to make a choice between warehousing dogs and life saving. So the idea is that if you're saving a lot of dogs lives, you're also warehousing them, you're holding them for many months or years. Um, they have no quality of life. Their care isn't very good. And if you are not warehousing them, you have to just give up a certain amount of dogs. Say, you know, when we get full, we're going to euthanize dogs for space. And we don't believe you have to make that choice. Um, it's not to say saving all their lives is easy. And particularly in times of space crisis, it can get really tough. But uh, many shelters around the country are proving that you can save lives, you can have a short length of stay, and we don't have to make this compromise, but we do have to work smarter. The second myth, myth that I'm going to try to dispel today is that somehow we hear that making decisions about what dogs live and what dogs die is somehow simple, it's uncomplicated, as if there's these two buckets of dogs. One is uh, adoptable and one is unadoptable. And this idea is inherited from the older days of sheltering when we didn't, we were still euthanizing from space for space. And today it's not really that, that is not really the case because we have created organizations where people feel like they can come and talk to us. They can tell us about the dogs they've had. We ask them for tons of information. So when we're getting dogs in our system today, we're, we're more likely than we were in the past to know something about them. Um, and some of that's good and some of it's bad, but all of our dogs are individuals. And so it's not easy to make, uh, it's not always easy to make those decisions. One of the other starting points for this presentation is that this is not a problem really about the dogs themselves. Um, medium and large dogs have always existed in our communities. Um, dogs have been living with people forever and ever, but we are in a particular social moment where it's actually getting harder and harder for big dogs to, to live in communities. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that there is a growing lack of pet accessible housing. If we have one big fight over the next decade, it's going to be to have that there be housing where, where medium and large dogs can live because any of you doing this work know that housing restrictions are an increasing problem um, and, and they're impacting medium and large dogs disproportionately. Um, people have crisis and poverty related issues. In our community, we are seeing um, an uptick in intake of medium and large dogs due to eviction. Um, and we know as the economy gets better and worse, we see increases in intake of medium and large dogs. Um, people have a lack of access to training and behavior support. They don't know where to get help or help is pretty limited. And so when they do have challenges with their young, bouncy, boisterous dog, there aren't necessarily easy ways for them to get help. We are getting more and more population dense in many places in, in the U.S. And so that makes owning big dogs harder and harder as people live closer and closer together. Those uh, the housing restrictions often um, are greater. And then we have the ongoing issue of breed stigma and breed specific legislation that, that bans entire groups of dogs, regardless of their genetic breed, um, from communities. And, and lastly, I think we have more people coming to, to us for help. Um, and that is a help. We are going to have to find a way to meet the needs that people are having as they come to us. We know that access to medical care is one issue, but also access to behavioral resources and access just to support for being a, a 
people getting support for being a dog owner, um, we're going to need to do a better job in those areas. Another a starting point um, is that we don't, the way that we approach the problem is not to throw any dog under the bus, to say that there's good dogs and there's bad dogs and the bad dogs need to be euthanized. We believe that all dogs are good dogs, um, but we recognize that a few dogs that in our care will be unsafe to place, but that number is really, really small. Um, those dogs exist and it doesn't say anything about their overall temperament, but based on their known history, we may determine that they're not safe to place. Shelters are hard or impossible pl places to know and learn anything about dogs. And it's really difficult for us to imagine anything about their future behavior. Uh, we have gotten a little bit better about sending them into foster homes to learn more about them, but we don't do, we don't try to pretend that we can know who dogs are in this um, intensely stressful, solitary confinement situation that couldn't be more unnatural for them. We pay attention to previous history. It tells us something, but it doesn't tell us everything. And um, because all dogs are individuals, a dog that does something once may do it 10 more times or it may never do it again. So previous history can be an indicator, but it is not everything. And lastly, context matters. Um, if you get one thing from this presentation today, it's that um, all behaviors and things that you think you know about a dog must be contextualized. And because dogs can't speak, it's our duty to become doggy investigators and try to figure out as much as we can about anything we think we know about dogs in shelters. That's one of my favorite pictures. That's one of our long stay dogs. Um, who, is, who was asking everyone to adopt him that way, and he did get adopted. So the problem we're trying to solve is twofold. Um, on one hand, shelters, even today, especially large shelters, are forced, they, they, they're faced with this decision to have to euthanize healthy adult dogs, either because they're full and they don't have room, uh, for incoming dogs or for this idea of behavior. And a lot of what we call behavioral euthanasia is really euthanizing for space. We're just calling it behavior because it's a little bit more palatable, I think, for, for those of us working in shelters and for our communities to understand. But most euthanasia happening is actually um, due to space, not space or resources, not behavior. Importantly, um, Dr. My, my colleague and, and mentor, Dr. Ellen Jefferson, always asserts that um, shelters aren't built to save these dogs. Shelters are systems built to move easy peasy pets through. Uh, they're often great for, for little dogs. They're great for kittens. But for more challenging animals, medically, behaviorally, and sometimes just because they're big, um, they're not going to move themselves through the system. And so we have to do our jobs better to help them get out. When I, I have the opportunity through Maddie's Fund to teach hundreds of students about fostering medium and large dogs, and more often than not, shelters today are naming big dogs as their number one unsolved problem. And that is important because we know the solution for community cats. We know the solution for saving neonatal kittens. We may not have the resources to get there, we may not have the resources for all the medical dogs, but we know how to solve it. And with medium and large dogs, it's a little bit different because a lot of organizations are saying they don't know what to do. So here's what you're gonna learn over the next few minutes. One, how to never use euthanasia as a method of population control. So how to never euthanize for space again. Um, how you can relatively easily get to a 98% save rate without spending a bunch of money or having a bunch of new staff. Um, how to develop a standard operating procedure for making life and death decisions for, for at-risk dogs. So these are dogs that are actually at risk for behavior. How to engage staff, volunteers, and advocates as partners um, in life-saving and help save your more challenging dogs. And how to give most every dog a fair chance at a live outcome. So um, automatically, a few people are going to have some critical feedback to this, the, everything I've said so far. So I wanna make very crystal clear, there are things we are not advocating in, in this webcast. Uh, one, we are not advocating that anyone save 100% of dogs. 
there are a few organizations that have that as their goal and there's some organizations doing that. That's not my area of expertise. That's an amazing goal to reach for, but as a municipal shelter director, my goal is to give most every dog a fair chance at a live outcome. We're not telling you to warehouse dogs, uh, to keep them for months to years on end. We're not telling anyone to release dangerous dogs. Uh, that word gets thrown around in a whole variety of contexts and here I use it not to refer to just legally deemed dangerous dogs, but dogs that have done really bad things um, that we have, a, a, we have reason to believe they would do those things again. Uh, we're not telling you to spend a lot more money. This is not a, a resource intensive plan and we're not telling you to know exactly what dogs should live or die. Um, in, in my time making life and death decisions for hundreds, if not thousands of dogs, what I've learned is that I will never know if I'm right because once a dog is, is dead, it's dead. We just don't know. Um, all we can do is to try to give that dog as many, um, to try to have a standardized rigorous process to give that dog um, as objective as decision making as we can. And we'll talk more about that coming up. Um, just, just so you know, I'm... Uh, just so you understand sort of what we're dealing with here, you can see on the screen, and actually they're sitting right behind me. These are our binders where we keep forms. These, we have um, euthanasia decision-making forms. These are the binders where we keep the forms. And um, on the bottom picture, the bottom binder is actually the forms of the dogs that we've euthanized. And the top one is the dogs that we have saved through implementing the process here at PAC. Um, there are still more dogs that we've euthanized than we've saved um, of dogs that were at risk. But that top binder is, is what we're going for, and it's, it's part of what we're going to show you um, how to do today. We need to start doing things differently. Um, we, not only does this increase life saving and give every dog a chance to be treated as an individual, but there is nationally in almost every organization, there are issues with mistrust and miscommunication among staff, volunteers, and advocates. What, what I'm going to show you today is going to help you mend some of those, um, those old relationship issues and help build trust with the people that care about the pets in your shelter. Um, we're going to I'm going to talk about data tracking to help you identify um, some of your own life-saving gaps. And it'll help you eliminate mistakes in decision making. Most everyone, if we pulled you right now and said, do you think you've ever made a mistake on a euthanasia decision, most everyone would raise their hand. Um, or say yes, we can help eliminate those. And it helps promote well-being among the people who are having to, to interact every day with these dogs. There is a reason that volunteers and advocates get so upset when a dog is euthanized that they have been caring for for weeks or months. It's because they care about that animal. And, and what we do here and what, what I'm gonna show you can help you respect the, the bond between the volunteer and the pet that they've been caring for. You need a few things to get started and you don't have to have this today, but when you're ready to start the process, you need to know your overall live release rate of dogs in particular, um, and that's live outcomes over total outcomes, really simple equation and nobody excluded. So whether they are owner requested euthanasia or owner surrender or stray, everybody's included. So you need that number. You need to know the number of dogs that were euthanized in one year period. Um, you need to know the number of dogs dying due to lack of space and dogs, number of dogs dying for behavior. And there's a good reason for this. If you look at our graph, and it might be a little hard to read the writing, but that big blue chunk and then the second biggest blue chunk and the green part, that is all injured, sick, and medical. That's important because the primary reasons that dogs are dying here at Pima Animal Care Center is medical. It's no longer behavior. So that means that we need to look at that life-saving gap um, when, we're, when we have that many animals. So when one, of the, one of the easy examples is that we had a lot of distemper dogs dying uh, and they were totally treatable, savable animals. We were really focused on our harder behavior dogs and we momentarily shifted our focus over to distemper because that was a big solvable life-saving gap. So you need to arm yourself with this information to make decisions about where you turn your life-saving lens next. So the next two parts are focused. First, we're gonna talk about the basics of getting the 90% and then we're gonna talk about how you save the more challenging dogs. 
the goal is to consistently save 90% of medium and large dogs and to do this without increasing length of stay or creating capacity issues. So it's not just that we're saving dogs, we also want to be conscious that we're not just putting them in a cage and leaving them there. That is not the goal of what we're trying to do. That's one of our, uh, I think that's one of our distempered dogs actually who, who got out. Now is a, I wanted to take a moment to talk about volunteers because we have, as a movement, in the shelters that are saving the highest number of dogs and doing it successfully, they are, are enabling volunteers to help in every way imaginable. They aren't putting restrictions on what volunteers do. They are engaging them in all different ways. So this picture is actually our first volunteer-led playgroup. Our volunteers are now independently leading playgroups at PAC. Uh, but they also, at PAC, we have six unique volunteer groups. We have one called Top Dogs. Um, they take our long-stay dogs and they teach them really cool stuff that helps get them adopted. Um, we have Purple Dot Walkers. Those are our more, more challenging dog handlers. Um, and a whole variety of other groups. I, I, if I try to name them all, I'll definitely leave someone out. So all these groups are working together and they're each focused on the dogs that they really care most about saving. And they help with everything from marketing to handling the more challenging dogs to doing the adoptions, they are key. And when we, the number one thing we see when we teach organizations around the country, the number one thing they don't have enough volunteers and they are not allowing and enabling volunteers to work in the, the many, many ways they could to save lives. And so if, you, if your organization is gonna make one change, um, in a large organization, you should have a thousand volunteers or more. Even in a tiny one, you should have a hundred or more. Um, and that's volunteers who are actually doing six hours of service a month. But we've also got to, we have to respect that volunteers also have opinions. And a lot of what we do here is to have hard conversations. And so I, I think that we have plenty difficult and challenging relationships between staff and volunteers, but the important piece is that we're working on it and everybody comes to the table with the same um, respect for everyone else. So these are the ways that you get, beyond having a lot of volunteers, here are how you get to 90. So this is sort of a checklist. We're gonna run through a lot of information quite quickly and you can come back. It's all written here on the screen for you for a reason so that you can come back and check in. But these are the things that you need to be doing if you wanna get your dog save rate to 90. So for communications, you wanna do daily public pleas for fosters and adopters. We talk about foster at PAC just as much as we talk about adoption, which is three or more times a day on social media, sometimes up to 10. Asking the public for help fostering and adopting every day is key. That can be done by volunteers if you don't have staff to do it. Number two, completely transparent, urgent pleas in times of crisis. We'll hear about shelters. Someone, a staff member from a shelter will post and say things are so terrible. We have 300 dogs, we desperately need adopters, but that's not going out to the public. So getting that word out to the public through news releases and through social media is critical. And then giving people ways to help immediately is also really important. Volunteers, rescue groups, staff, they need to be given notification and seven day deadlines for at-risk dogs. Seven days is just barely enough for people to organize getting um, dogs out. If you are a, an organization that's giving no amount of time for people to save animals, start with three days. That's something, but that's a really hard time frame to work within. Um, we recommend seven days for people to help get at-risk dogs out, whether it's for space or behavior. Walk through videos and photos of dogs and kennels. This is something that still most people aren't doing and it's like social media gold. You just take your iPhone and you walk down your kennel row and you look at the kennel card with your phone and then you look at the dog in the kennel People love that because people are busy. They don't necessarily have time to come over and look through the shelter, but they love the ability to see what's happening in your shelter at any given time. And it will get people into your organization to adopt that day. Um, long stay dogs should be featured in communication multiple times. If you have a dog that's been in your organization a long time and it's just kind of hanging out, it's what we call a hidden gem, 
that dog should be featured on social media every other day until it's adopted. Do, and people start to follow the story. And after you post two to four times about that dog, somebody will come, uh, come in interested. So for care and shelter, we use playgroups uh, for assessment, for enrichment, and for co-housing selection. Playgroups are fun. They're also a way we get to know the dogs. When we're assessing in playgroup, we aren't making, we aren't saying that dog didn't do well in playgroup, it should die. We're saying this dog may be selective with this type of dog, or this dog didn't seem to like going to playgroup. And we're letting dogs pick their friends, which has been a huge reason that our co-housing is so successful is because the dogs are actually choosing their own buddy. These are two of our, um, our long stay, or two of our very, very bonded dogs who loved each other. And um, we got them out together by sharing videos of them in, in their kennel and, and playgroup. So they actually got a home together. Um, Dog-driven co-housing is the norm. So co-housing is better than not co-housing. Solitary confinement is not normal. And somehow in sheltering, we've come to believe that it's totally normal to put individual dogs in individual boxes where they, they build up all of this frustration and anxiety and stress is normal. We co-house not because we have to, but because it's better for the dogs. Um, and they do so much better here. And if, if you are not yet sold on this, see how fast they get adopted once they're co-housed, you will be absolutely shocked. People love seeing a co-housed dog because they get a general sense that dog may be, may be um, a good fit for their house if they have other dogs. Um, we do daily kennel enrichment for every single house dogs. Uh, that has actually helped us reduce bites in shelter because the dogs have something to do with their mouths and they're not coming out as stressed. So everybody gets nyla bones every day and then they get every other thing we can possibly throw in their kennel at any other time. Um, we are not restrictive about enrichment because even if we are, the dog is gonna go home and their owner isn't gonna be. Um, and this does not create mass problems. It's, it's actually pretty awesome. Um, dogs get twice daily kennel breaks, even in our big shelter uh, with three to 400 dogs on site. Thanks to our volunteers, we're able to get uh, most dogs out twice a day. And we also, any of our kennel broke dogs are dogs that are really, really, um, they are potty trained and they will not go in their kennel. Um, those dogs, we, give it, we mark that on our walker board and we give them additional breaks. And lastly, any dog that has been there greater than 14 days gets additional behavioral support. This is something we're always working on, but we try to focus on those longer stay dogs so that they don't start declining. Um, as far as our policies, so we have a, a bunch of policies that actually get dogs out faster. The goal for us is to move them through the system as quickly as we can, because by moving quickly, we don't get the problems with behavior decline and other associated problems of dogs being in the shelter for a long time. Uh, the picture that you see is actually one of our kennel cards. And you can see at the bottom, we have these little icons. Those are built into our, we're, we use Chameleon. They're built into Chameleon. So this is how our kennel cards print. And we actually design these icons and um, are happy to share them, but it's easy to make your own too. And these just tell the potential adopter anything that we know about the pet. Um, and we really want people to, we want to give people as much information as, as we can on the kennel cards, especially because we have so many dogs in the shelter. Um, this really helps get dogs adopted. And you'll also see that we have a I'm back from foster care uh, label on this kennel so that the, we let the foster talk to the potential adopter about their experience. So all adult dogs are available for foster or adoption unless there's a reason for them not to be. When you come to our shelter, you can foster or adopt a medium and large dog. We do have exceptions to that. If we have dogs that we know are gonna fly out of there, if we have a purebred poodly doodle and we know that thing is gonna get adopted in two days, we may not make that animal available for foster, but as a rule, all of our adult dogs can go either way. Um, dogs are immediately available upon intake that doesn't mean they can leave. We have a stray hold just like everybody else, but we have something called pre-adoption, which is where the adopter pre-adopts the dog. So they can say, I want to adopt this dog if and when it becomes available. And they fill out all the paperwork, they pay their $50, and then they sign a contract that says that they understand the pet may get reclaimed by the owner. And what this means is that the second that animal becomes available, it goes to spay or neuter, 
it gets all of it, it gets everything it needs, and then it's out of there. So it's a way to really, really speed up your system. If you're not doing this, you should. It is a game changer. So third, volunteers can foster or adopt any dog they want. If they wanna take somebody home, they can. Why is that so important? Because the people most likely to take home your more challenging, um, obnoxious two-year-old bouncy dogs are the people that are interacting with them every day. Those are your volunteers. So we encourage our volunteers to take home any pet they want. And if they want to adopt that pet, that's awesome too, but they don't have to. Volunteers can work with our harder dogs. We have five different levels of handling um, based on how challenging the dog is, and you get different training for each level. So for our dogs that are doing the jumpy, mouthy, leash biting thing, that can be a real safety risk in the shelter, even though it's largely a shelter-based behavior most of the time, that's our highest level. Those are our purple, purple dot walkers. They have the most training and the highest level skills. And then the volunteers that start out are walking our senior dogs and our easy peasy guys that are, are just a lot easier to handle. Um, no dogs are housed in the non-public areas of the shelter. This is still a big mistake most shelters are making, they have too many dogs off public view. As much as possible, stray dogs, dogs that are getting some medical care, everybody should be available to be seen by the public. Um, we learned this lesson actually with kittens. Some of you have done what we've done and that's to put um, ringworm kittens on public view and they just like fly out of your shelter. It's the same thing with medium and large dogs, especially when they're on stray hold. You will get them pre-adopted. They will be out of your system so much quicker. The every day you hold a dog off public view is a day that it's essentially living in solitary confinement in your shelter with no ability to get placed. Now, that is not to say that we put every dog in public view. We have dogs that pose an actual safety risk and we have dogs that have contagious illnesses. Those guys are gonna stay in the back um, if they pose a medical or safety risk. Everybody else is gonna be out in the main areas. And lastly, um, same day foster and adoption pl placement with a one hour process. So that's right. I come in, I want to adopt a dog. You say, or I want to foster a dog. You say, yes, absolutely. We'll sign you up as a foster. You leave that same day. Um, that, is, that is true for foster and adoption. We don't have any restrictions in place. So we treat fosters and adoption essentially the same. Um, sometimes we'll encourage people to adopt, but sometimes with a medium and large dog, they're just more comfortable if they have that extra time to uh, get to know the dog. And so maybe they foster for a week. Um, we have a 30 day cap. So what we do is that if we, in 30 days, we try to contact you. And if we can't, what we let you know is that we will outcome the animal at a certain point. If we, if you are wanting to keep it in foster, you have no issues. At a certain point, that animal will become yours. And I, I'll talk more about that in part two tomorrow. The foster centric model is the really the keystone. It is the heart of what we do here. Um, it's why all of this works and it's because it's such a fundamentally different way of treating our dog population. Half of all of our dogs should be in foster at any given time. So typically the number of dogs in foster will equal the number of dogs in care. We all have three to 500 dogs in foster at any given time. We have all kinds of foster programs from field trips to overnights and there are no barriers. You can come in and you can foster a dog same day. If you are a first time foster, yep, it's likely you're gonna get one of our easy older senior dogs or just one of our goofy, we call them green dot dogs, but we're not gonna put any barriers in place for people to foster, whether it's for a couple of hours or for a couple of days or until the pet is adopted. Our volunteers and fosters can take videos, they can take photos and they can share them on social media and they can send them to us to share as well. We have foster programs for, for phosphorus animals, pets that are going to die. Um, our goal is that, uh, and this is an unmet, unreached goal, but our goal is that no animal dies in the shelter, um, that all of our animals can pass away um, in the arms of a foster parent who loves them. That's not reality, but it's, a, it's a, one of what we call one of our stretch goals. Um, we have foster programs for behavior dogs, long stay dogs, senior dogs, medical dogs. Different people all have different kind of interests in certain kind of pets. Uh, for me, I know I love distemper dogs and I love old dogs and 
very tiny old dogs. And for other people, they want to take home a behavior dog or for another person, they may want to take home a foster. Based on kind of your interests, you can foster the kind of pet you want to. And that's why we have all those different programs. We talk about foster as often as adoption, and there is no wait time to foster with us. You can foster on, the same day that you come in is when you start fostering. And this is one of the flyers that we plaster everywhere. There were a few things I wanted to share today that didn't fit neatly in any of those categories. So here are just a couple of them. Number one, let volunteers access your shelter software to enter notes, to read notes, and to help learn about the dogs. They need that access. You can have special training. We have that because of security. We have special training for our volunteers that we let them access the shelter software. Create specialty programs for volunteers. I, I, I suspect that specialty programs are really the future for big organizations because just having a volunteer program, it's too much to even like bite off, even to think about when you have a thousand volunteers. The specialty programs are so important because one, they're, they're volunteer driven and led, so the volunteers manage them, and they're based on people's specific interests and the lives that they want to save. So whether it's older cats with medical issues or senior dogs or hard to handle dogs that are declining behaviorally, volunteers self-organize into groups and they do amazing things when they do that. Out of the box adoption events. We keep seeing, we, we have a tendency in animal welfare probably because we're all so busy to kind of just do the same thing and think it's going to keep working. Um, and so we have gotten, we have really rethought all of that and we try to do new wild adoption events. We recently did one called Midnight Muttness. It was, ju we just stayed open until midnight. We had food trucks, we turned it into a big party and we got more than a hundred animals adopted that night. And we had so much fun. We had hundreds of people from the community come and visit. Those kind of adoption events are fun for staff, they're fun for volunteers, and they get pets adopted. And they bring in a whole different crowd than another adoption event night. Every day you should, your first email in your inbox on every, any given day should be your kennel census and the length of stay of your dogs. You need to pay attention to those things because we consciously work from those things. Every day we're looking at the census and we're making a plan based on how many dogs are in care on that day. And every day we're looking at the long stay list and we're making a plan based on the, what dogs really need our help the most. Um, holding public play groups on weekends. Even if you're like not, you haven't been through all the play group training, you're feeling a little nervous, taking some of your dogs that are just do, do really well playing with other dogs, throwing them in a play yard and inviting the public to come watch. Uh, we always recommend that you get some training to do play groups, um, but Taking some easy dogs, even if they're co-housed dogs, people seeing dogs playing together gets them to want to adopt them. And lastly, the last tip is that we've started to market bonded pairs of adult dogs. This is something I resisted for years and years and said, no, we have to move faster and this is ridiculous. And if one gets adopted, we need to just let it go. But we, we also got a, our volunteers really pushed us on that and said we needed to respect that some relationships between dogs were really important and some dogs had lived together their whole lives and that separating them was an ideal and so we started to market adult medium and large dogs as bonded and believe it or not we're having a ton of success getting them homes together so thank you volunteers for pushing us on that okay so we talked about getting the 90, that, that all of those things are sort of our checklist for the things you need to do to get yourself to a 90% save rate for dogs. But there's still this outstanding problem, which is dogs that are actually at risk, dogs that have a history or not doing well in the shelter. Um, and that's kind of a different issue, although not totally unrelated. We've done a lot of polling of shelters to find out what dogs are at risk for them. And there's, this is all based on talking to other shelters about the issues they're facing. So there's roughly four categories. There's this kind of low level category of dogs that are scared or shy or stressed, mildly jumpy mouthy, or dogs that have just been there forever and there's no real good reason they're there. They're just sitting in your system. So for that, that category, that grayed out category one, that bounce, address all of that with the things that we talked about in the first part. 
So the things that we covered in the first part really will get those dogs moved through your system more quickly as well. Um, primarily foster for almost every one of those. Foster should be your first answer. Um, <clears throat> as well as making sure that they're getting appropriate enrichment and aren't just living in solitary confinement in a, in a kennel for weeks or months without actually getting the opportunity to leave the shelter. Category two is this known history of some kind of behavioral challenge. So you know something about the dog, whether it had separation anxiety in the previous home, it was hard to handle in the shelter, um, the dog may be reactive, it might do some leash biting, it might be acting, quote, feral um, or non-social. That is where we get into a lot of you are still euthanizing dogs for just that. So just those behaviors are enough to say, yep, euthanize. Category three is the one that, that is a little bit even harder. That's dogs with any bite history, regardless of severity. Um, dogs with known history of aggressive behavior. Dogs that are running at large plus any aggression and dogs that are harming other animals. That category three is where we start, even where we're at, we start to euthanize some of those dogs and save others. And then there's category four, and we're just gonna call those really hard dogs today. We are not addressing those. Those are dogs that we're still euthanizing, dogs that have um, inflicted severe bites on humans, um, dogs that are, have a known history that actually we believe there may be a safety risk um, and would need very specialized placement. Those are, we're not gonna really get into those today. We're gonna primarily focus on categories two and three. This is from a poll we did through Maddie's Fund, and I, this is a little surprising to me when we did this poll. It was about a year ago, um, and it was a presentation I think I did with Kelly Dewar, who does a lot of the Maddie's Foster stuff. And we asked, we asked the attendees, and there were several hundred people on the, um, answering this poll, what puts dogs at risk? And you can see that bite history is by far the highest followed by fear-based aggression, so being fearful, um, resource guarding, and barrier reactivity and kennel stress. So all of these things are putting dogs at risk in shelters. You, we talked in part one about the initial data you need, but to delve into this problem, there's other data that you also need. So you need dog by dog data. You need the notes on at least the ability to read the notes about any of the dogs that are at risk. So that includes behavior notes, medical notes, notes from the finder, the owner, notes from volunteers, and notes from your animal protection unit um, or your animal control unit. So anything that we know about the dog, you need to be able to read on a case-by-case -case basis. Two, you need to know the specific factors that are putting dogs at risk. So what is it in your shelter? In some shelters, I think people really aren't sure other than any history. Um, that can mean a million different things. And then you need to know the daily dog inventory and how many kennels are available. And this, that number three is to really find out, are you, do you have space to hang on to one of these more challenging dogs? Because it's always a consideration when shelters are more full, they're less able to help the hardest dogs. But we look, and, and, and my staff um, will sometimes come and say, we really don't have space. Um, and, and the tendency then is to go to the hardest dog and to say, can we euthanize this dog? And our staff here doesn't do that very much, um, but that's common at other shelters. So the first thing that we're going to do then is look at our kennels. And you can see this is our kennel screenshot from, from four days ago. And the double blue kennels on the screen are the empty kennels. So we know we've got one, two, three, four, five, six kennels that are empty. We've got a little wiggle room, which means we can spend a couple of days investigating more about the more challenging dogs. So we, any dog that is at risk for an actual behavioral behavior sort of gets bumped into this case management approach. It's an individual approach. It's not, there's no blanket restrictions. There's no, you did this, now you die, case by case. Um, this is one of our at risk dogs. I didn't have anywhere convenient to share this, but it really works. When we have a dog that's at risk for behavior and it's a stray, we will actually post this, it's a flyer, we'll post it in the area where we found that dog in hopes of actually finding the owner. Um, it's just another way we try to save their lives if they are at risk. So number one, the dog is gonna get flagged for review by our behavior team. Uh, the case manager, that's Tamsin sitting there, she's gonna review all the notes about the dog. 
gonna try to find out as much as she can. She's gonna make sure that the dog is interacted with outside the kennel in some capacity, if that's possible. There's some cases where the dog isn't handleable. Um, those are really rare. Uh, in 99% of the cases, we're gonna get the dog out of the kennel and we're gonna interact with it, either taking it to play groups, taking it on a walk. Sometimes we'll take it out to lunch and get it a, a hamburger and just get to know the dog outside of the um, stress of the kennel. And dogs with a known history or more serious behavioral challenges, so dogs that have caused harm to an animal or person, those are always gonna be brought to my desk. And I, myself and the deputy director, review all of these cases as well. This is a totally um, imperfect, non-scientific chart. Um, I included it because it, it includes some of the factors we consider. And this is all because we're trying, we're operating, trying to treat every dog as an individual and trying to look at the factors that might lead to future behavioral problems. So these are, and, and the pie chart doesn't really represent the um, importance of any of these factors. But a few of the factors that we consider when we're looking at these cases, we look at our own capacity. So do we have the space to address, to give this dog time? And for us, the answer is almost always yes. Um, and if we don't have the space, the answer is not euthanasia. The answer is emergency foster plea. Um, is the dog reactive in the kennel? Is it does, it, does it redirect on the handler? Does it try to redirect on another dog? What's going on with the dog in the kennel? Um, is the dog behaving safely in the shelter? So we have a lot of dogs that come in and they have some known history, but they're totally easy to handle in the shelter. Um, that, that means that we have more time to figure out more information. Uh, does the dog have a known history of causing harm? Has the dog actually done something or are we just feeling nervous that the dog is giving us a side eye or cowering in the back of the kennel? We, uh, we want to know if the dog is good with other dogs in playgroup or how it interacts. Is it like seem to enjoy playing with other dogs? We, we get a fair number of dogs that have had a dog to dog altercation or a dog fight at a dog park or in the home and then seeing them in play group really can tell us a lot about where their future placement may need to be and um, lack of impulse control is one we can we included um, it's something we're sort of starting to think about and lastly containment issues containment issues are a big one because we most behaviors can be managed in a home but if that issue has um, if the dog also has containment issues that's an additional level of concern for us because we then have to think about can the owner manage to keep the dog contained that's not it though we don't just look at those factors and it's not like a chart where we add up a score and the animal lives or dies we look at a whole bunch of other stuff we consider the dog's history and its home a lot of the dogs that come to us with a negative mark on their record They've lived great with cats and kids and dogs in the home, and that matters because it could tell us something about their future ability to do so. We look at how big the dog is, and this is a really terrible thing to have to do, but if we have a tiny dog with a behavior history, a five-pound dog versus a 60-pound dog, there is a difference, in, a likely difference in that dog's ability to, to cause harm and the level of harm. So that is a consideration, is the size of the dog. We look at the context and the circumstances of negative incidents. So we try to figure out if something bad did happen, why did it happen? I'm gonna give you a great case study in a minute. Um, we look at the severity of injury. So did the dog cause an injury and how bad was it? And we, we oversee animal control. So we're able to see photos often of any injury that was inflicted. How does the dog act at the shelter? How handleable is it? We look at whether there are multiple factors. So um, if there are six of the problem behaviors, um, that might be a little bit different than if there's one of them. We look at whether there's multiple incidents. So has the dog um, aggressed towards multiple cats or just one cat? Um, we look at the fan club status is what we call it, but we look at how many people this dog is attached to because that matters. If a dog is attached to multiple volunteers who are advocating for it, it's been in two foster homes, that's a lot of people who might help us find a viable outcome for that dog. And it's why volunteers are so important because when you really do need help, they're there to help you find outcome options. And then we look at potential adopter foster rescue placement. Is there someone in the community that'll likely take this dog? So this, that T-bone is one of our hardest Worst kennel presentation of probably any dog I've ever encountered in a shelter. He was absolutely terrible. 
but he had lived in a, he had lit, his previous home had had kids, cats, dogs. We knew he had this pretty amazing home history with no incidents. Um, and we were able to place him with Roman, who you see there, who's a dog trainer. And we knew Roman could handle any issues that would come up. And now T-Bone actually has received a couple of years of training by Roman. And he now, T-Bone travels with his dad around the country to teach people about uh, dog training. For every dog, we're gonna look at possible pathway options. So where can the dog go if, it, if we need to get it some special care? Because dogs with challenging behaviors, just sitting in kennels with no care is not the solution. Here's a couple of our options. We have something called the decompression program, which is an amazing group of volunteers. The decomp program works with our fearful, our dogs that are likely to be fear aggressive. The dogs go into their program they work with the dogs one-on-one -on -one multiple times a day, and they eventually graduate them from the program and they get adopted. Um, so some of our dogs go to that program and it's been truly life-saving for a number of years now for us. Foster care is always the first option for most situations. If we can get a dog in a foster for two hours or two days, we're gonna do it because we get so much more information about the dogs that way. We have something called the special needs adoption. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Some dogs, we just continue to evaluate them. And by evaluate, I don't mean look at them and decide if they should live or die. I mean just spend time with them and interact with them outside of the kennel to learn more about them. We have something called a short-term rescue deadline. That's when we don't feel like we can place the dog from pack and we don't feel like we can accommodate the dog's needs at pack because we are dealing with such an extraordinary volume. And then lastly, we have some dogs that we just do a euthanasia notification where we let staff and volunteers know the dog's going to be euthanized due to a severe behavior incident causing harm to a person or animal. So the special needs adoption is a really important category. And it's where you take your dogs that have something on their record. So, um, you know, Lacey is a wonderful dog. Four years ago, she attacked the cat in the home and the cat died. Or um, Frankie, this is some, something we had come up recently. We had a dog that lovely and flagrant, really awesome, but that had been asleep in the home and a child jumped on the dog uh, while the dog was sleeping. The dog turned around and nipped the child very minorly in the head. So those are dogs that we need to make sure the adopters know about these things. They're not deal breakers for adoption. So the special needs adoption is an indicator on the kennel card that the public doesn't understand, but our staff does. So an SNAB is an SNA um, special needs adoption, special behavior counseling. And an SNA plus is special needs adoption. Uh, some, there's some incident in the dog's past we need to tell the, the adopter about. And the reason these categories are so important is that the counseling is then performed by a supervisor or manager. And we ensure, uh, we do this with all of our adoptions, but that supervisor or manager ensures that the adopter has full information, everything they could need to know in writing and verbally, and that they understand the needs of the dog. So we also send those adopters home with behavior tip sheets and we tell them how to get in touch with us if they need behavioral support after adoption. Short-term rescue plea is dogs that have done something that we're not, uh, we feel like they need more than we can give them at pack. Again, we are taking in about a thousand dogs a month. So we are not set up to provide the level, uh, the intense level of if they need behavior modification or behavior support or just support after a traumatic incident. So this dog had been, um, had defended its owner during the domestic violence situation. The owner was a woman who was being um, assaulted by uh, someone and the dog actually um, actually injured the person assaulting his owner and the then the person turned on the dog and you can see the dog had a pretty severe injury. So that dog actually did harm a person. Um, the dog was really upset and seemed pretty traumatized in the shelter, um, was pretty shut down. We felt like that dog needed more than we could give it. And so that dog ended up going to a rescue partner who committed to rehabilitation and taking time with the dog. And um, he is a wonderful dog and got what he need because he was able to go to a rescue partner. We give the short-term rescue pleas for a dog like that. Rescues get seven days. 
And if they have a viable option identified at the end of seven days, then we will extend that deadline. If they do not have a viable option, we don't generally extend the deadline. Some dogs we set a deadline with, um, and we do this not infrequently, probably three to four dogs um, a month minimum, sometimes more. We make, so some of the things you need to do if you set a deadline, you should share a plea with volunteers and rescue groups give plenty of time, make sure people can actually see the dog. If you put a dog on a deadline, make sure that the people who might be able to pull it can get to it. Um, reach out directly to rescue. So for a dog like this, that this was one of our short-term dogs, we certainly reached out to lab rescue. Um, and then we extend the deadlines anytime we think that someone is pursuing an option. Sometimes it takes two to three to four weeks to get a viable option. So if a dog is truly, truly, truly at risk, we fill out this form. That's what he showed you the binders of earlier. Uh, and this form goes through all of the things we do before we euthanize a dog for behavioral reasons. We don't do every one for every euthanasia, but importantly, we go through the checklist. We say why the dog is at risk. And then at the back of the form, we have four signature sign offs. So whoever completed the form, and then it's gotta be signed off by either the deputy or the deputy director or the director of the organization so that we know every dog um, whose life is being ended. And probably the most important thing that we do in the, this process is all really important. And there's another presentation we'll point you to at the end, but just having the people who are signing off the form meet the dog um, becomes really important because there's sometimes in just meeting the dog, um, we are really surprised by what we find. Um, and so we meet the dog, we go through this process, and sometimes the dogs live, sometimes they don't, but we're tracking the data on every one of those ones that's dying. If you're going to euthanize for behavior, here's what you must, must, must do before you do it. One, make sure you even have the right dog identified. It is really common for us to not even have the right dog, especially in animal control cases where we bring in three and four dogs. Review all the notes you have and then call to confirm any incident that happens. At least half the time when our staff calls to confirm an incident of a bite or other aggression, the story is so different when we call back because people are often reporting when they're in crisis. Um, so calling to confirm is crucial. Interact with the dog outside the kennel anytime you can. Let people know and give them time to help, whether it's staff, volunteers, or rescues, uh, and make sure that people actually meet the dog and interact with it, because sometimes what's reported does not match up to what's in front of you, and always have your top leadership sign off on those euthanasias. When you think about what not to do um, when you're euthanizing dogs for behavior, don't euthanize without notification, especially if it's a staff or volunteer favorite, it's a dog that's been with you a while. Don't hide dogs that are at risk in the back of the shelter unless they're truly a safety risk in the shelter. If, they, if possible, keep them in places where people can access them. Um, don't mark low level behavior dogs as rescue only. This is something we're finding all over is that people have dogs that are just fearful and they mark them as rescue only. Fearful dogs are often some of your most adoptable dogs because people really wanna help a scared dog come out of its shell. Don't send them to a sanctuary without researching that. There's only a, a handful of sanctuaries taking medium and large dogs that are providing adequate care. We hope to see that change in the next couple of decades. Um, don't send them to adoption or foster without telling the foster and adopter everything you know. If you have a dog with any history, that the person taking it home should know everything that you know, um, told in an objective way. Um, and don't defend decisions when you're wrong. This, the, that dog is, is one of 25 that uh, we got in that were really, truly, nearly feral. And I decided they all needed to be adopted. And so they were getting adopted and they were... Um, running away from their homes to all come back to the shelter to be together. And I could have I could have stuck my flag in the sand and said, we're going to keep adopting them. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm right here. And instead, we had a rescue group that approached us and asked to build a um, sanctuary for those dogs in particular. And we said, yes, and they did it. Um, and now those dogs are housed in a way that they, they don't have to run away from their homes. They all get to be together and they're living the good life. 
so this is a two part webcast for a reason. Um, I, on, on one hand, I feel like I've never talked this quickly and I'm sorry to those of you trying to keep up. This is a ton of information and it is a complex subject. This isn't simple and there are no easy answers here. Tomorrow, what we're gonna do is delve into how it works. If you're, if you're sitting here and you've just watched this webcast and you're just like, oh, I don't know how I'm ever gonna do this. I feel overwhelmed. Don't worry, we're gonna break it down for you tomorrow into step-by-step the action items and we're going to take tons of Q&A. So we're going to take your questions and answers. We're going to spend at least half the time answering the questions you have and I promise tomorrow if you'll get that um, in-depth information, we'll be able to respond to your questions and you can start saving more lives uh, literally after that webcast ends. So thanks everyone for joining us, uh, whether you're listening or watching and thank you for fighting the good fight to save more medium and large dogs. And thank you, Sheila. Kristen, that was fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us today. It was wonderful. And we thank all of our viewers for watching. For those of you who'd like to continue today's discussion or have questions for Kristen, please join us for tomorrow's session at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 Eastern. And please visit the Maddie's Pet Forum webcast group. And finally, thanks for watching and for all you're doing to help the animals. Have a great rest of your day.